Today I'm reading from Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst, Volume 2. And today I'm going to read an essay by Dr. Anne Belford Ulanoff, who is Emerita Professor of Psychiatry and Religion at Union Theological Seminary blundering into the work of redemption. It is hard to write on the red book. You touch it in one place and all the other places catch your paws like Tar Baby. The trickster as Br'er Rabbit tricking the wolf now tricks us. How to find words for the venture in Liber Novus without draining away its life as well as draining the journeys stirred up in us reading it. Our own mystery play. We get abstracted by our interpretations or submerged by unconscious currents carrying us out to sea. Of course, Jung's critics want to say he is mad. That is the best protection against being initiated into our own task of linking the below and the above. Jung is living this experience in its midst and is true to his vow to take seriously every wanderer he encounters. He does not clean up the text but lets his complexes show in all their strife and anguish. Nor does he sum up his venture with a clear conclusion but stops abruptly, saying in the first instance he must go back to the Middle Ages to deal with the barbarian in himself, and in the second, stopping mid-sentence, he must go forward with the help of alchemy to absorb the overpowering force of the original experiences. This essay focuses on three aspects of a central theme that threads through the book and on Jung's mode of addressing it. One blunders into the work of redemption neither beautiful nor pleasant, and so difficult and full of torment that one should count oneself as one of the sick and not as one of the overhealthy who seek to impart their abundance on others. Jung feels nauseated, empty, a beggar, his path more than a thousand feet deep, indeed, a cosmic death that takes him beyond what he knows to where the pliers of the spirits of the depths held me and I had to drink the bitterest of all drafts. Redemption means being saved, claimed, made good, recovered, regenerated, reformed, what Jung calls smelted anew. His mode of apprehending is blundering. 1. Temptation of the Good Jung's redeeming work begins from an original angle. Quote, Christ totally overcomes the temptation of the devil, but not the temptation of God to good and reason. Christ thus succumbs to cursing. Unquote. The good is what we identify with as our highest value our hero that we must disidentify with, indeed kill, as Jung murders Siegfried with the help of a small brown man, a self-figure. The heroic in you is the fact that you are ruled by the thought this or that is good, indispensable, attained in headlong striving work, this or that pleasure should be ruthlessly repressed. You sin against incapacity, but incapacity exists. No one should deny it, find fault with it, or shout it down. This hero, Jung, also calls our ruling principle and identifies his as intellect, reason, logos, thinking, force, efficiency, masculine, science. God has become identified with only the good of our developed ruling principle that excludes in us and in our culture the bad, leaving it to the mercy of decay. Jung descends to his personal hell, 
so boring compared to the fun and daring of everyone else's hell. There he must deal with the rubble of everything he shoved off the table as bad, stupid, sinful, that now leads him to develop his incapacity, from which emerges paradoxical intelligence, knowledge of the heart, eros, feeling, feminine, and what he calls magic, which we need to receive or invoke, the communication of the incomprehensible. Jung hears, quote, you will believe you have sunk into meaninglessness, into eternal disorder. You will be right. Nothing will deliver you from disorder and meaninglessness, since this is the other half of the world." Unquote. But for him who has seen the chaos, there is no more hiding, because he knows the bottom sways. Even Jung, hard at work writing his red book, The Soul Chides, and us too, the authors toiling over chapters for three volumes on the book. Do you still not know that you are not writing a book to feed your vanity, but that you are speaking with me? Jung takes 25 nights in the desert to awaken his soul to her own life until she could approach me as a freestanding being separate from him. Jung approaches redemption from a new perspective. Just as Christ tormented the flesh through the spirit, the God of this time will torment the spirit through the flesh. God does not appear in the flesh, but in spirit. What is done to this God you do to the lowest in yourself. Who should accept the lowest in you if you do not? Radical acceptance of all parts of us reclaims what has been rotting in our own personal hell. The location of transformation happens now in us in the sight of the innermost, our psyche, soul, not outside us in gods, laws, teachings, or ideals of art, justice, reason. The beginning is always the smallest. It begins in nothing. I see the little drop of something that falls into the sea of nothingness, where the nothingness widens itself into unrestricted freedom." Unquote. Jung emphasizes the inextricable connection of personal and collective dimensions of our lives. When we serve the good to the expulsion of the bad, it lands on our neighbors. In the name of the good, we try to kill the bad, thereby destroying community. In personal relations, we discover the bloodthirsty tiger that our neighbor denies. Quote, you conscious only of your goodness offer your human hand to me in greeting. And suddenly I felt a smooth cord around my neck, which choked me mercilessly, and a cruel hammer blow struck a nail into my temple." Unquote. On the collective level, Jung learns the work of redemption includes accepting that we, too, can imagine intending and willing atrocities and hope never to be doing them. We cannot cling to the good as protection against that awareness. I understand this to indicate our task is to hold in consciousness both our capacity to exert terrible attitudes and actions in tension with the good we love and serve. We consciously suffer this fierce stretching, neither enact nor repress the bad and thus suffer the dissolution of a defined distinction of good and evil. We therefore personally contribute to communal harmony by knowing we can harm each other. This radical knowing with the heart comes to Jung through modes of apprehension associated with the feminine, for that is what he neglected. 2. Changing Gender Jung changes gender in his Red Book, returning to his masculine identification, enlarged and made more fluid. His mode of experiencing is to be in every encounter, not removed into abstract classification, but besieged by madness. 
up close with harangues from his soul, singing incantations mourning Isdabar's sufferings, excited to discover Isdabar's reality as a real fantasy. Painfully strung up in his own identification with Christ's crucifixion, if a feminine mode of relating is to be in the midst, touched, immediate, Jung is visibly here, even as a lonely, ignorant wanderer. Only gradually does he rescue ability simultaneously to be in the midst and reflect, previewing an expanded capacity for masculine and feminine modes at once. Jung becomes pregnant, his soul as womb, gestates and gives birth to a new god. Later he becomes pregnant again with another child that might be understood as his work from which he must differentiate himself to let everything sprout. The sun grows out of himself. The myth commences, the one that need only be lived, not sung, the one that sings itself. The sun, his work, he contributes to collective life. Jung returns to his garden, for while he is a woman gestating and birthing a child, he becomes himself a child to the god, a state he finds humiliating and shattering, but also that reaches a presuppositionless consciousness, full of divine astonishment, chosen over the ashes of rationality. This child consciousness that is free of constricting prejudgments is not the withering deadness of childishness, but the entry path of what is to come. The God is a child, and Jung is a child serving this God. He sees all of this. The spirit of man is a conceiving womb of God. Jung's soul is feminine and not maternal or any kind of motherly container, exclaiming in response to Jung, complaining of hardship, woe, wanderings. I am not your mother. She is another standpoint within him and a freestanding real presence in her own right, challenging his vanity, ambitiousness, self-absorption, addiction to words. In disagreements with her, he often yields, but not always. She, part of primordial origins he will later call mothers of the depths, and the mother who comes back as fructive creative principle, is the birthplace in him of the new God. Jung sees a man must become a woman to be able to see the otherness of soul and avoid becoming enslaved to women. We all must go beyond the gendered, but not as a hard rule. Rather, each person responding appropriately to her or his actual situation, hence making space for diversity of paths. Jung's identification with this feminine part of him grows from seeing how badly he mangled it and from his efforts to redeem it. Salome first appears as crazed, blind, murderous, bloodthirsty, and grows into a sane, sighted, womanly presence. She desires to give her love to Jung. He recoils. He fears intimacy with another would stifle his freedom and impose the burden of her life on him. He insists, instead, everyone must carry his or her own life. He encouraged his wife and mistress to find their unique paths. Yet in writing and living the Red Book experience, Jung's actual dependence was heavy on Emma Jung, who raised their five children, sustained a steady home, presided over a big house, staff, finances, became an analyst, and helped to inaugurate the Analytical Psychology Club allowing Jung freedom to create his new version of psychology. For that, he depended absolutely on Tony Wolfe, who received and interpreted his fantasies and collaborated in creating new ideas of psyche, for which she received no official credit or footnote. 
Jung said of his Red Book experience, you need another, and probably a woman, and of his soul, he said, I found you again only through the soul of a woman. Tony Wolf was his sole companion for a time, and how can that be credited on a book's title page? Became an analyst and presidential force in the analytical psychology club's life. Depending on these two women simultaneously, the three of them privately and in public suffered and enjoyed the pairing, so unconventional at the time, with sadness and gain to each. Jung presented seminar material on his Liber Novus ventures, depending on members to receive and validate his psychological experiences. Jung relied on some women colleagues' responses to chunks of his manuscript. He salutes the many women whose work in analysis helped him gather into theoretical articulation a feminine capacity within a man capable of enkindling relationship between conscious and unconscious. A trenchant encounter with the feminine is Jung's discovery of a beheaded body of a small girl left in the bushes. A shrouded figure says she is the soul of the child and commands Jung to ingest a piece of the child's liver to atone for her violation and murder. Outraged, repulsed, Jung resists, then yields when recognizing he as a man partakes in the worst of human depravity and thus could have participated in the girl's desecration and killing. The shrouded figure now reveals herself as Jung's soul. Hence, his soul is feminine and is also the soul of this dead female child and Jung atones for violation of both. He sees that by ingesting the girl's flesh, he destroys his formation of God that was an act of highest creative love, and now, instead, receives within his body hot coals of the living God, from whom there is no escape. This God is real and wants to dwell with Jung in his everyday life. The gravity of changing the image of God and its placement within the body of the self also radically changes the image of the distinction of good and evil and of the relation of self and other. 3. Self and God. A. Good and Evil. Jung's soul is also soul of this small violated girl an image of his undeveloped feminine as part of his incapacity. The rubble he rejects as bad and leaves undeveloped in his personal hell. Jung learns that at the bottom of our incapacity, quote, evil that stares at you coldly, unquote. We thus blunder into redeeming our image of the distinction of good and evil. The God is not just our highest ideals of good, nor does it only dwell outside of us. The coals of the living God are placed inside us, the innermost site of our psyche, through which we have any picture of self, God, or others. If we put all our force, energy, into the ideal good God outside us, our human self is drained of aliveness and left mired in the bad we tried to expel. God is then only of the above and excludes the below. We must take that energy back into ourself and recognize psyche in us as bridge to the God transcending us. This God includes the below and the above. Our former picture of their sharp division dissolves. Good and evil unite in our growing from the below to the above. Good and evil unite in our growing from the below to the above. If we stop growing, they fall apart into hostile, vying. But the warmth of life, which contains good and evil inseparably and indistinguishably, that is the way of life. Yet this is not the goal, but the way and the crossing. 
beginning of the recovery, unquote. B, God image. Jung focuses on the distinction between God and God image. Facing the temptation to the good, Jung sees he cannot exclude the bad, and that changes our image of God. If it is true that the soul is not a maternal container for us, but rather the other standpoint within us, for the God is always where you are not. For Jung, that location challenges his ambitious vanity and undeveloped feminine modality, which for him is related to feeling. The point is that the Godhead is also the other within us, in the form of God images our soul through our psyche creates, and not some idealized distant deity unconnected to our all too human selves. We do not create or find God, but deal always with our images of God, who also exists external to ourselves. The new image of God manifests as, quote, the supreme meaning, the bridge to what is to come. That is the God yet to come. It is not the coming God himself, but his image which appears in the supreme meaning. God is an image, and those who worship him must worship him in the images of the supreme meaning." Unquote. This meaning includes images of the below, too. nonsense, absurdity, ugliness, ambiguity, as well as images of beautiful, good, and true. We cannot put into God just the good and leave out the bad, lest we drain away energies of our aliveness and pile the bad onto our neighbor. God wants to sit at the table with me, work with me, be ever-present. Jung objects, quote, the divine appears to me as irrational craziness, unquote, stealing into reasonable, meaningful human activity. This is the real, living God. Jung's ingesting of the murdered girl's liver, surely an image of the below, destroys his image of God as idealized good, but leads to putting the glowing coals of God into the self a God he cannot escape from, but will face in the humdrum of daily life. In taking back into the sight of the innermost, our image of God, we return all that force to the human psyche, breaking down our previous God image domesticated in the Christianity of the spirit of the times. We confront the temptation to the good in order to evade the divine nearness of the transcendent within our very body self by idealizing the good in a far distant God outside us. But Jung sees that he cannot by himself destroy his formation, image, of the highest God to which we are enthralled. Clinically, we see God images landing on whatever we call the goods, money, political power, substances that call to us in drugs, drink, certain foods, what we see as our highest ideals of knowledge, art, science, love. Whatever acts like a god in our personality around which we revolve as the ultimate value for positive or negative effects. I understand this as a foundational image whose destruction would make us feel we lose our mind, become disoriented, that madness will overtake us. We cannot will to destroy our God image of the highest good by ourselves, but only in shocking dependence on evil to do it for and with us. Jung says, quote, you cannot dissolve good with good. You can dissolve good only with evil, unquote. That dissolution leaves us with what to do in the face of evil. Our personal problem with the bad opens to the human problem of how destructiveness finds a place in living. Jung reaches his amazing response. 
good and evil unite only in growth from below to above. When growth stops, they fall apart into violent rivalry. We, too, must develop solutions to the place of devastation in existence. C. Others and Self The link between individual and collective life is unavoidable. Working on our personal individual problem with what to do with the bad turns out to be our contribution to the impersonal collective problem with evil. No matter how tiny our work on the bad, it is our contribution to the huge human problem to find the place for annihilation in aliveness. We are linked to each other and the small inextricably links to the large. Evil dissolves the formation of the highest God. What we blunder to redeem, however, faultily, contributes to the shared human task of seeing the distinction between and the interpretation of our personal, individual, and shared, collective tasks of facing the temptations of the good and of evil. God and Self The Red Book opens and closes with direct references to God and the relation of God and Self. At the book's beginning, Christ is the one whom Scripture describes, quote, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrow, unquote. Quote, Unto us a child is born, called Wonderful, Counselor, unquote. Quote, The Word was made flesh, unquote. At the book's end in the garden, Christ is the shade who brings the beauty of suffering, which I understand as the possibility that suffering, bad as it is because related to the worm, evil, may include creative response. Jung lost his soul connection to the God image prevalent in the spirit of the times. Searching for his soul, he blundered into God images different from this conscious God, but that were real which he knew because of the unshakableness of the experience. Dread grips him because images of what is to come differ radically from what is familiar. Hap designates God's other pole of the night, the flesh and blood spirit of bodily juices, sperm, entrails, joints, eyes, ears, feet, sputum, excrement. Jung fights with his soul who, though a steady if strenuous guide, also aims to run off to heaven for her own salvation with the treasure of human love. No, Jung says, human love is his and humanity's lifeblood, and she should work for the good of humanity here. She yields Differentiation initiates between the need of the dead and the living, between precious ego life versus life in the hereafter. Philemon speaks to the dead and to Jung about another god image, Abraxas, as creative force, formless and forming, the stream of life, creative drive, form and formation, and the sucking gorge of emptiness, and counsels we are to live our life against the force of Abraxas, for our individuation counters Abraxas's blasting power. The dead crowd in because of their unlived life pressures. They did not individuate, but childishly cast the burden of their redemption onto Christ, whose command to love each other they disobeyed and killed instead. They denied the animal in themselves. They failed to atone for the ox with the velvet eyes or to do penance for the sacred ore that they dug up from the belly of the earth. In contrast, Philemon tells Jung, we must not naively put our small self into the bigness of God, since the God is an unfathomable, powerful movement that sweeps away the self into the boundless, 
into dissolution. Jung fears this threat could plunge him into psychosis. Quote, a living God afflicts our reason like a sickness. He fills the soul with an intoxication, with reeling chaos. How many will the God break? Unquote. Yet Jung survives the influx of the God by brute strength and with a dawning, uneasy insight that the small, narrow, and banal is not nonsense, but one of the essences of the Godhead that lives with us every day in ordinary ego life in the world. So we must, Jung sees, establish ourself, pull ourself to our side from God, wrestle with the God for the self, free the self from the God, so we can live. Yet later, Philemon says we should live in the God, not the God live in us. Jung perceives, quote, not the self is God, although we reach God through the self. The God is behind the self, above the self, the self itself, when he appears our heaviest wound, unquote. Having gained a sense of self, we then elect to give it or not to God. Quote, I believe we have the choice. I preferred the living wonders of the God since I want to live. My life wants itself whole, unquote. But the way that happens is to live your very own life to the full. Quote, there is only one way, and that is your way, unquote. Four, devotion. Jung, who wrestles his undeveloped feeling into living, fills with ardor, not to another person, but to love itself, not to fame and ambition, but to living his own path, tending his garden humbly. From his experience of giving birth, Jung reaches voluntary devotion. Shedding commingling of his ambition for personal fame with love, thus redeeming his feeling function. Although this dismembering is painful, it yields Jung's decision for what is required of me. I accepted all the joy and every torment of my nature and remained true to my love, to suffer what comes to everyone in their own way, and I stood alone and was afraid. In full-hearted allegiance to the soul that speaks through his psyche, he later confides that our libido, which he calls serpent energy in the Red Book, is the divine pneuma in us, and that he looked for a sign that the spirit of the depths in me was at the same time the ruler of the depths of world affairs. Think of Jung's sustained feeling as devoting 16 years, carefully painting his pivotal experiences to show the mysteries that lived him. This private endeavor marks what is to come, only published decades after its creation. Living our life to the full includes our unlived life. Live what you have never yet lived. The life I could still live, I should live, and the thoughts that I could still think, I should think. This way feeds community and does not sap it by imitating our neighbor and neglecting our own becoming, nor foisting on others what we want them to be instead of greeting their otherness. May each one seek his own way. The way leads to mutual love in community. If we fulfill the need of the self, through this we become aware of the needs of the communal and can fulfill them. But if you give up yourself, you live it in others, thereby you become selfish to others, infect others. To live oneself means to become one's own task, a long suffering, since you must become your own creator. Jung's way is wrestling with self and God and, through that, serving others. To Jung's astonishment, his way means to become Christ, not just to follow Christ, but to engage temptation of the good, not just of evil as did Christ, 
to suffer torture of the spirit by the flesh, not just torture of the flesh, but the spirit as did Christ. Jung sees he must suffer his own mystery play, not imitate another's, nor should we, for you have your own. Utterly poor, miserable, unknowingly, humiliated, go on through your gate. Jung does not identify with God, but remains himself. You do not become God, but God becomes human as a child. I become Christ in the mysterium. I was made into Christ and yet am completely myself so that I still doubt. In saying to follow Christ is to be Christ means that Jung and we pursue our unique way as Christ did his and accept the suffering that comes with doing so with good and evil, with self and other, with personal and collective, with images of God. It demands everything, and Jung accepts even enlarging his gender in giving birth to this sense of God, redeeming the feminine without which he could not engage his Red Book venture and come through it. Living our unique way with all it demands means accepting death into life. By becoming as if a dead man, sacrificing striving, letting go of what had been his ruling aims and modes of being, knowing about instead of participating in, certainty over ambiguity, Jung accepts that in the depths to be that which you are is an endlessly slow growth, with knowledge from the heart which is in no book, not in any teacher, but grows out of you like the green seed from the dark earth, drawing darkness of death from the beyond into every day, empties the beyond because we live all we can here. Death is a booster shot to live right now, reminding us that we are not forever. If I accept death, my tree greens. Limitation enables you to fulfill your being. Therefore, the demands of the dead disappeared as they were satisfied. The dead also represent the wisdom of the ages, not just personal unlived life, but accepting limits of finitude. We can draw upon the sages of the past for the life to be lived now. Uniting with the serpent quells the devil's influence that invades through one's own serpenthood, which one commonly assigns to the devil instead of oneself. I took part in the humiliation and subjugation upon myself and gained stability that could withstand the fluctuations of the personal. Therefore, the immortal in me was saved. Jung arrives at his personal God image and says this is possible for everyone. It is thus that we are host for the gods. Our God image mothered by our soul forms our personal answer to Abraxas, the effectual itself that produces truth and lying, good and evil light and darkness, life and death in the same word, and act. Abraxas is terrible, our differentiated individuation process to find and create our God image is the gateway to the God and our response to Abraxas. The blind creative drive becomes transformed through individuation and out of this process which is like a pregnancy, arises a divine child, a reborn God, no more dispersed but being one and this individual, and at the same time all individuals, born in many individuals, but they don't know it, a spirit in many people, the same everywhere. By living our life to the full, we find our particular image of the divine child, born in our souls, and it throws a bridge across death. Philemon advises, this one God is the kind, the loving, the leading, the healing. To him you should pray. You are one with him. He is near you. 
nearer than your own soul. I understand this to mean the more devoted we are to this healing God image, the more we participate in the whole which wants our contribution, the less the more blasted by the force of being, Abraxas. Devotion to our own most way enriches the wholeness of the whole. Philemon describes the celestial mother, the final intimation of the feminine in the book, as, quote, spirituality conceives and embraces, it is womanlike, unquote. Jung may come under her aegis when he completes his separation from commingling that arises through unlived love, where he still bonds with men and things. Jung submits to shredding motives competing with his voluntary devotion by remaining true to love and willingly accepting all the pain and suffering. Only thus do I arrive at my truest and innermost self. By way of our blundering, the time has come when each must do his own work of redemption." Unquote. And so that completes the reading of Anne Belford Ulanoff's essay, Blundering into the Work of Redemption, uh, which is, appears in volume two of Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. Now, the one thing I should do also here is read the description of Dr. Ulanoff. Anne Belford Ulanoff, PhD, studied philosophy at Harvard, BA, theology at Union Theological Seminary, Master of Divinity, and psychiatry and religion there as well, PhD, and has received three honorary degrees, LHD. She is the Christian Brooks Johnson Professor of Psychology and Religion Emerita. I've heard her referred to as Professor of Psychiatry and Religion, but here it says Psychology and Religion. She is the Christian Brooks Johnson Professor of Psychology and Religion Emerita at Union Theological Seminary, a psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City, a member of the Union Psychoanalytic Association and the International Association for Analytical Psychology, and serves on the editorial advisory board of the Journal of Analytical Psychology author of six books with her late husband, Barry Ulanoff, among which are Religion and the Unconscious, The Healing Imagination, The Witch and the Clown, Archetypes of Human Sexuality, and by herself, author of 16 books, among which are The Female Ancestors of Christ, The Wizard's Gate, Picturing Consciousness, The Functioning Transcendent, Finding Space, Winnicott, God and Psychic Reality, Madness and Creativity, Knots and Their Untying, The Psychoid, Soul and Psyche, Piercing Space-Time Barriers. She is a graduate of the C.G. Jung Institute of New York and recipient of many awards, among which are the Oscar Pfister Award from the American Psychiatric Association for Distinguished Work in Psychology and Religion, the Gradiva Award for Best Book in Psychology and Religion 2002, the Vision Award from the National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis. <music>
There he must deal with the rubble of everything he shoved off the table as bad, stupid, sinful, that now leads him to develop his incapacity from which emerges paradoxical intelligence, knowledge of the heart, eros, feeling, feminine, and what he calls magic. Okay, when she's in this segment, when she's talking about the authors toiling over three volumes, she's referring to the 50 Jungian analysts who have written essays for this series called Jung's Red Book for Our Time. Sean, how do you access the Dropbox? Uh, send me an email to skip.conover at gmail.com, and if I have not added you, I will add you. And if I have added you, I'll send you the link. How's that? Think of Jung's sustained feeling as devoting 16 years, carefully painting his pivotal experiences to show the mysteries that lived him. For example, now then she gives a bunch of uh, point, pointers. I'll read them, but for example, see images, folio volume I, 22, 29, 54. See also images with page references in the text, 71, 288, note 141, 117, 303, note 222, One twenty three, three oh seven, note thirty three, one thirty five, three oh nine, note two forty eight, one fifty five, three seventeen, note two eighty three. Uh, I would rec recommend that you buy this book so that you can um, actually look at those notations. They're hard to follow. I'm reading this afternoon from Young's Red Book for Our Time. Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions, edited by Mary Stein and Thomas Arst. And I'm reading from the essay by Dr. Anne Belford Ulanoff, Blundering into the Work of Redemption. Section which I thought s sounded very Buddhist. Uh, he said, I accept death, my tree greens. Limitation enables you to fulfill your being. Therefore, the demands of the dead disappeared as they were satisfied. And just observe that in Buddhism, one meditates on death very frequently. Also, some of these footnotes are to volume 15 of the collected works and uh, specific paragraphs I would mention yeah, that have been footnoted are paragraphs 287, 301, 351, and 356. Okay, so those were footnotes to volume 15 of the collected works of C.G. Young.